Hikey dikey. Uh, yeah, so um, this is kind of a follow on paper from another paper uh, that I presented a few years ago at VMKI. Um, and it's kind of trying to um, take what I did before, which was kind of ad hoc, and actually encode it into a declarative rewrite system um, and basically figure out if I could do that and what the performance was like. Um, it's done in the context of Wiley, um, but to be honest with you, it kind of appeal has more broad application than that. Um, and so it's kind of a loose connection. I guess Wiley is the reason I got to this point, but in fact, it is more general somehow. Cool, okay, uh, so flow typing. Uh, so we, uh, in the first presentation, there was a brief mention of flow sensitive typing. Uh, so flow typing is kind of my, um, I don't know what the right word is, kind of uh, vision for how that could look. Um, and Wiley is my programming language. This is a little excerpt of Wiley up here. And Wiley uses flow typing, and, and quite a few other languages um, are using flow typing for various reasons these days, like um, Ceylon, um, TypeScript, uh, Facebook Flow is also using flow typing, and so on. Um, and it looks really cool, I really like it. So the key thing about flow typing is that when I use an instance of test here, a type test is, then it's gonna automatically retype that variable for me, okay? so. Okay, it's not that helpful on the true branch, but on the false branch here, I kind of need it, right? Um, so it looks really cool, I really like it. It's an absolute nightmare to implement from a compiler writer's perspective, okay? Um, which, yeah, I didn't really realize what it was gonna be like when I started the project. Probably if I was gonna start over again knowing what I know now, I might decide against using flow typing because Wiley is not really about flow typing in a sense, it's actually about checking pre and post conditions, and you can see I've got a little post condition up there, okay, just to illustrate that. Um, so flow typing is a bit of a distraction, but it is kind of neat, and it kind of is sort of a part of Wiley now, so I can't go back on it. Um, and the hard stuff is basically having negation types, intersection types, and recursive types. Um, and, well, the question is, well, where are those things in my example? Hmm. So um, recursive type's kind of easy. We can see linked list is a recursive type, okay, because it refers to itself, right? It's not a, it's not a reference, so um, it's not like a C uh, sort of struct that is recursive. Um, it's a true recursive type, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this presentation. Um, but we can't see the intersection types and we can't see the negation types here. Um, I can write them in the language, but they will arise anyway because of flow typing. So in particular, on the true branch, we're going to take the type of the variable that we are testing against, which is list in this example, and the type that we're testing against, which is null in this example, and we're going to intersect them together. So the type of list in the true branch is going to be brackets null or you know record, list record, intersected with null. Right? That's the actual type of list. And yeah, we can see, uh, hopefully immediately, that we can simplify that to null. Right? Yeah, that's cool. Um, and likewise, on the false branch, what we're going to do is we're going to take the type of list, which is you know null or record, and then we're going to subtract the type we're testing against, which is null in this case. Uh, and in fact, I don't have a subtract. Operator. What I have is a negation operator. So what I do for subtraction is I take the thing and I intersect it with the negation. So I take a null or record, intersect it with not null, and then that will simplify in this case the record. All right, so it's kind of, no, it's not so hard actually to understand, I guess, um, but it is complicated to implement, I mean, in particular with recursive types, make it hard. Um, yeah, okay, right, cool. So, um, so I guess the question is, yeah, how do I implement it? And in the compiler, I had an ad hoc implementation, and this implementation caused me lots and lots of problems over the years. Um, it's, it's been good in the sense that it's been moderately reliable, but when I have to make changes to it, it is tough and lots of things break. So I, I've been searching for a better way to do it. Um, and this is kind of what led me down this, in this direction. Um, so I'm gonna reduce it for the purposes of this paper, I'm reducing it to this much simpler type system than we have in, in full Wiley, um, which is just easier to sort of reason about and talk about. Um, but basically we've got any type, which is like our top type, we've got void, which is like the empty type, the bottom type, we've got integer, which is my sort of token primitive, um, We've got tuples, which are like records. We can think of them as records in Wiley, okay? Tuple types. Uh, we've got the negation type, which is not T. And we've got intersection with, you know, um, logical and, and logical or for union types as well. So I didn't show a union type in the, uh, yes I did. Yeah, I did show a union type, good point. Um, the union type is the bar, right? So that's null or, um, that's the union type. Should have said that. Cool, okay, great. Um, 
And so we have some interesting things. This system is interesting, and it, it's different from type systems in languages like Java and sort of most mainstream languages, almost all mainstream languages, really, um, in that we have these kinds of equivalences between types. That's what makes it difficult. So like any is equivalent to not void, right? Yeah, okay. Int intersect any is equivalent to int, right? They're syntactically different, but semantically equivalent. And so our type system has to be able to reason carefully about these things. Um, and in particular, we want to be able to do subtyping in the presence of these arbitrarily complex types. So in this case, um, I've got int intersected with not int. Well, that's actually going to be void, right? And so you know, I should be able to reason quite comfortably that that is a subtype of void because my subtype operator is transitive, right? Um, and so the question is, how do I implement a sound and complete uh, subtype operator? And soundness basically means that if my algorithm, right, which is here, these two things are subtypes, then it's correct. They are truly subtypes, right? Soundness, easy, okay. Completeness is basically saying, look, um, if we imagine the set of values that my two types represent, and we consider subset, you know, uh, a subtype is like being subset, then if it's the case that my values, one is a subset of the other, then it must be the case that it says that thing is a subtype of the other. Right, so if they are really subtypes, then it must say, yes, they are really subtypes. So it must, it can't say, no, I, I couldn't figure it out. It must say they are. And, and getting both is what makes the problem difficult. Getting one or the other, not so hard, but getting both um, is what makes it difficult. And this is a kind of really common approach. We, we're gonna implement them using typing rules. There's, you know, as I'm sure many of you have seen typing rules like this before. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. The details don't matter too much, okay? Um, this is a bunch of typing rules, very similar to typing rules that have been written in papers using similar uh, type systems that I'm talking about here. Um, and basically, we try to deal with intersection, you know, all the different bits in each rule. So this is like, say, one rule for intersection types. It basically says, if this type is a subset of this intersection type, then it's got to be the case that that type is a subset of each of the elements of that intersection type, and so on and so on and so on, okay? Um, so this is fine. This is, well, I mean, it's not fine, but it's sound, right? So it's a sound type system, but it is not a complete subtype operator, okay? Um, and in fact, trying to, trying to build the subtype operator in this way, trying to fiddle with rules like this, trying to make a subtype operator that was complete, and every time it kind of comes down to, ah, oh, there's this example that it can't show as a subtype. Okay, I'm gonna add some rules to deal with that example. Oh, now there's another example. Okay, and I just keep going. And so I just kind of scratched my head for ages. And eventually I got to uh, the sort of way that you, that you need to think about this, right? And the way to think about this is to think about subtyping not as subtyping in, in, in the sense that we were thinking about before as type rules, but as rewriting. And it comes down to this equivalence between subtyping and, and intersection types, I guess. So basically, if I'm saying T1 is a subtype of T2, I can rewrite that, rewrite that by saying T1 intersect uh, negation of T2. Have I got that the right way around? Have I got the wrong way around? Hmm, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, T1 intersect, sorry. <laughs> negation of T2 is equal to void, right? So if I look at my Venn diagram, I'm basically saying, look, if T1 sticks outside of T2, there's a little bit of T1 that sticks outside of T2, then it's obviously not within it, right? And so basically I'm saying there's nothing there. And that's kind of cool, because when we think about this, I can, the question becomes not, am I doing a subtype test? But the question becomes, am, can I rewrite this type to void or not? And that's really the key thing, because it completely changes how you start to think about implementing this operator. Um, and so, yeah, so basically, so I had this paper from before, which is a VM code, where basically I worked through all the process of how you actually do this, all right? Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of a big warm up because I want to try and set the context properly, okay? Um, but basically it comes down to roughly translating our types, rewriting our types into a sort of canonical form, um, which sort of, I called it canonicalized disjunctive normal form. So it's a variation on DNF. Um, and roughly it looks like this. I've got star. I'm gonna talk about what that really means in the context of this talk, okay? Um, the details are in the paper though. Basically, we want to rewrite it into conjunctive normal form, and then we want to do some a bit more to it, and then either it's void or it's not, and, and we're done, right? Um, so, I mean, this is just showing a type being expanded 
into DNF. It's not really very exciting, to be honest with you, but you know, I'm just going to distribute intersection through my uh, union type, um, and then I'm just going to apply the simplification. So like int intersected with any is just int, and so on and so forth. And eventually get to here, and then I've got one more step, and I'll end up with the actual answer. Um, so in the paper, I solved the problem using basically just an ad hoc algorithm that I just wrote in the paper, right? And uh, you know that's kind of fine, and I reasoned about it, and I argued that it's true, and so on and so forth. Um, but still, it's basically just a bunch of LaTeX, right? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's not a it's not a piece of code. Um, but what I noticed is that the algorithm had a really clear similarity with rewriting. The way that I presented it was essentially using ad hoc rewrite rules, pretty much. Um, and so the question arises, well, given this algorithm, can we then implement it in a declarative rewrite language? And that's the question that I looked at in this paper. Um, and so I chose a rewrite language. It just happened, funnily enough, I suppose, that I had a rewrite language lying around that I was using for building my automated theorem prover, which is a totally different part of Wiley. I'm not going to talk about it today. All very exciting. Um, but I had this, uh, this rewrite language, which was perfect, because it was already my Wiley compiler, you know, I was already using it, obviously I understood it quite well, and I was like, well, can I do it, right? Can I do it? And it had some nice features which turned out to be, which turned out to be useful. Um, basically, uh, what the tool does, it takes in my rewrite rules implemented, um, you know, in a, a DSL, basically. Um, it will type check them, um, it will then do code generation and spit out some Java source code, and then I will compile that into my compiler, and I can then use it, and that's kind of cool. Um, and that, you know, that whole chain was already there, so it was kind of quite nice. Um, the idea for generating Java source is just to try to be efficient. And I would say there's definitely more work that could be done in terms of making it efficient. I did do some optimizations, but we could definitely do a lot more there. Um, uh, and there's a previous SLE paper talking about that if you're interested in, in more details about the language. Um, so yeah, the question is, can I actually do it in, in YRL? That's really the question. Um, and so here's my kind of encoding. So at the top, we've got how it was presented in the paper, and here we see the actual encoding in the rewrite language. Um, and we see it kind of, it's, it's not too bad, right? We see all the, the different bits. I've got any, void, you know, these are my sort of primitive atoms. Um, and like you can see in the negation type, I've called it not, um, which takes a recursive type, uh, an instance of type, I guess. Um, and then I've got a tuple, and it's a bit difficult to see, but there's got square brackets, and that means I've got a sequence, a list, of types, and the dot, dot, dot just means zero or more, okay? Um, and then for like early cases, which means it's actually a set, as opposed to being a sequence, it's a set, so it will remove duplicates automatically for me. Again, zero or more um, elements. Um, and I can do some kind of neat things if I want to say like one or more and so on and so forth, but it doesn't matter too much here. Um, and so I can basically encode my system directly here. And you'll notice that I've got, oh, I've got a typo, the excitement. Um, that I've got pairs on my intersections and unions, and here I've actually got zero or more. That just turns out to be quite nice because you can flatten nested unions and this kind of stuff. It's just really convenient. Um, and in fact, in the paper where I originally presented the type system, that basically it was implicit that things like T1 or T2 was equivalent to T2 or T1. Um, and using the, the, uh, the rewrite language, that is you know, part of how that re the rewrite language is sort of specified, I guess. So it turns out to be quite neat. Um, and we end up with basically with terms like, um, uh, uh, so, you know, int or the tuple of int, int is basically going to be a term or with int and tuple and int inside it and so on and so forth. Okay, I am going to make a, get a wriggle on, I think. Um, cool, uh, so here are just some rewrite rules to give an example. I'm not going to show the whole system. It, it's, it's too much. There, there isn't enough time. Um, but we can see very simple kinds of rules at the top. So this is just for reducing a not where I've got a primitive type B, and it's basically saying, okay, if B um, is any, in fact, it should really be just a Boolean type. So it's basically either, uh, is that right? No, no, that's, hmm, that's interesting. Why is that? Anyway, okay, I don't want to get too distracted. It feels like it should be either any or void, really, there. Um, but basically, if it's void, then I, oh, sorry, if B is any, then I'll reduce it to void. So not any becomes void. Uh, and if it's not any, or if it's not void, then it should reduce to any. That's really what I'm supposed to be saying there. Sorry about that. Um, likewise, we can see with not not type T, 
then it's going to pattern match on not not and reduce it to t. Now, it can happen that on a given term, we have multiple applications of a rule onto that term, and the order in which they're applied is just non-deterministic. So if I had like not, not, not something, then exactly where it applied the rule would be an interesting question. Um, mostly, that doesn't matter. Uh, so we have um, what I call unordered matching on sets, which is also sometimes called associative, associative uh, commut commu commutative matching, um, which basically means using my curly braces here, I'm pattern matching on a primitive type here, which is int, any, void, and so on. Um, and uh, I've got a bunch of other types here. And what that means is anywhere in my set, if I match a primitive, then I'm going to match on that type. Um, so it doesn't have to be like at the beginning of a set or something like that. It can be just anywhere in there. Yeah, okay, I need to get a really big move on. Um, it could be anywhere in there. Um, so it's kind of quite neat to be able to do that, actually. It's a good feature of the language. Um, and a similar, I've got list and set comprehensions, which are very useful for dealing with the collections. Okay, so I'm, so I made the right decision, obviously, of not going into too many more details because I'm already really short of time. Um, but basically, uh, this is how it was presented in the paper, and the question is, could I actually translate that into the declarative rewrite language? And the answer is yes, but there were some, some issues. In particular, I make use of some arbitrary operators um, in my presentation, which are essentially functions, but my rewrite language has no support for that, so I have to come up with an alternative way to encode those functions. Um, and, and it works, it works, for the most part. Okay, uh, so looking at the experimental results, so having made it all work, I then actually want to compare it, so what I did was I ripped out the existing um, subtype operator out of the Wiley compiler, um, I generated the code from uh, my rewrite rules, uh, and then I ran them over a whole bunch of subtype tests, and compared their performance, right? And so the question is, well, where did I get these subtype tests from? And so I got them from three, well, three different main sources. Uh, the first one is basically um, the compiler comes with about 520, in fact, it's 590 now, uh, test cases, which are Wiley files that are compiled and type checked. And so of that 590, well, 520 for this example, um, in order to compile and type check them, it does about actually 16,000 subtype tests. I had to filter out some of them because they can't be described in the language of types that I've got, um, and it left me with 14,000 odd type tests, um, subtype tests. And um, those, I made a second data set, which were just the unique ones, because this set is really dominated by primitive subtype tests, like int is a subtype of int and all this really boring stuff, which kind of seems a bit unfair. So I made this unique set here. Um, and similarly, I've got a benchmark suite, which has got 26 odd programs doing things like N queens and LZ77 compression and so on and so forth. And so I generated over 6,000 um, test cases and then I filtered them down again. It only left only 88 unique ones, which is kind of not a very good data set. Um, but if we look at the timing, so comparing, uh, I've used 25 warm up runs and 50 runs, um, averaged over 50 runs for, these, for the data points. Um, we can see that, roughly speaking, the rewriting implementation is sort of twice as slow. Well, yeah. Which is not bad, actually. It's pretty better than I was expecting, I'll be honest with you. Um, and we can see the reason why, when we actually look at the number of rewrites, the average number of rewrites it has to perform, it's actually really small. And that's the key here, is that you might imagine it's performing a lot of rewrites. In fact, it doesn't need to. Okay. Um, so we're kind of, I'm going to be quick at this point, because I am running out of time. So I did this kind of other thing. So I had the real world um, test cases from my test suite and my benchmarks, but then I was like, well, it doesn't feel like it's enough. I want to generate some random types, basically, and do some random subtype testing. Uh, so I came up with this concept of a type space which allows me to describe a set of types. And so you have a, a width, is it which way around is it? Yeah, it's depth and then a width. So the first number is the depth and the width is the second number. So, if, so T00 is kind of easy because it means there can be no depth Right, so I can't have any nesting, okay, and it can't have any width, which goes hand in hand, in fact. Um, so it can only be the, the primitive types, and I probably should put void in there for the, uh, no, because, well, yeah, no, nah, anyway, it doesn't matter, but yeah, you could imagine void being in there. Um, and then, like, C11 is basically saying I can have one level of nesting and I can have one depth. So that's kind of like um, unary operators, basically, so the negation type, and I can also have tuples of, um, just single elements and so on, but I don't allow intersections that have one element, it doesn't make sense, and so on and so on. And so we end up being able to describe the space. It's kind of cool because you can calculate the size of the spaces quite easily, um, and you can enumerate them very easily without loading the whole lot in memory, which means it can actually be done, otherwise it just runs out of space basically quite quickly. Um, and so for the really big ones, I had to sample them. I couldn't do all of the, 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 the tests. Basically, I just 
for each space, I basically just um, take the product of subtype tests for all possible subtypes. Um, but I had to sample the bigger ones, which are these two here, basically. Um, and roughly speaking, what the data says is mostly as before, it's twice as slow. But actually, for some of them, you can see this one here, that one there, it's actually going, as, they, as those spaces get bigger, it is actually starting to slow down quite a bit. And that's somewhat what I would expect. OK, I'm basically out of time. Um, it's somewhat what I would expect because the rewriting implementation is a lot more complex in some sense, a lot more abstract than my hand-coded ad hoc implementation. Um, but still, I still think the results are very encouraging, actually. And again, you can see the number of rewrites is not massive. Um, yeah, OK, so I won't talk about recursive types. If anyone knows anything about co-inductive rewriting, I'll be super interested because that seems to be the bit that's hurting me. Um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, Basically, I had a complex type system arising from flow typing, but it can also arise in the context of XML schema, typing XML schemas, and so on and so forth. Um, and we've implemented a declarative uh, version of that type system in my rewrite language. Um, the empirical, empirical results is kind of encouraging, which suggests this could actually be a useful way to do this and make my life better. Um, I also implemented a Rascal implementation as well. Um, and Rascal was really good for this um, because it did allow me to overcome some limitations I had with my rewrite language, but I couldn't make a sensible um, performance comparison against Rascal because Rascal's not really designed to be, um, at least at the time, um, it's not really designed to be used in a manner that makes a performance comparison that helpful. So I did do a performance comparison, but Rascal did so badly that I didn't want to put the results into my paper because it's totally unfair if I did that. So, so I left them out. But, but it's on the, um, in the technical report, you can see the Rascal implementation. And it's actually quite nice. So I kind of think my conclusion is this has got lots of promise. Recursive types remain a major question mark, though. Thank you.